welcome to the Children's and Teen Health Summit. I'm your host, Carla Atherton, founder and director of the Lotus Health Project, lotushealthproject.com, where we empower people to get healthy and stay healthy in mind, body, and spirit, and on the social, global, and environmental levels. For this session of the summit, I am excited to be speaking with Dr. Kelly Brogan. As an undergraduate at MIT, Dr. Brogan studied cognitive neuroscience and worked with Harvard undergraduates to create a public forum for the discussion of alternative medicine, directing conferences for the Hippocratic Society. She attended Cornell Medical School, where she was awarded the Rudin Scholarship for Psychiatric Oncology and began her work in reproductive psychiatry, where she went on to train in during her residency at NYU Bellevue. A strong interest in the interface of medicine and psychiatry led her to pursue a fellowship in consultation liaison psychosomatic medicine at NYU Bellevue VA Hospital. Since that time, she remains on faculty and has focused her efforts on her private practice where she cares for women across the life cycle, including pregnancy and postpartum, and on teaching, lecturing, and writing to an international audience interested in evidence-based, non-medication approaches to psychiatric symptoms and women's wellness. Her academic areas of interest include toxicology, environmental medicine, nutrition, inflammatory models of mental illness, autoimmunity, and epigenetics. She's published in the field of psycho-oncology, women's health, and perinatal mental health, alternative medicine, and infectious disease. She's on the board of Green Med Info, Pathways to Family Wellness, NYS Perinatal Association, Fisher Wallace, and medical director for Fearless Parent. She's the nation's only physician board certified in psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, as well as board certified in integrative and whole holistic medicine. Welcome to the summit, Kelly. It's so great to be here, Carla. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here this morning. Kelly, your bio is full of very intriguing qualifications, I must say. So some of which I'm not really familiar with. Um, would you please You're share? You're not the only one. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> like, yeah. what is, uh, you know, yeah, what is that? So would you share some information about some of your work so we can get oriented about, you know, your fields of interest, what you're doing, what you've been studying, that kind of thing? For instance, what is reproductive uh, psychiatry and psychiatric oncology? What are those? Yeah. So uh, psychiatry is uh, is a field that has been trying mightily over the past you know six or so years to define itself as a medical specialty and to come you know out from the fringe. But and in that effort, there are several different subspecialties and sometimes even sub subspecialties. And the ones that really caught my attention during my training were those that acknowledged the mind body connection. Essentially, were those that acknowledged that there are many different physiologic underpinnings to psychiatric symptoms. My fellowship was in, it has many different names, consultation liaison psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, but essentially I was called to consult on medical, surgical, and obstetrical patients who had psychiatric symptoms ranging from delirium to mania, to suicidality, to insomnia. And the understanding was that these symptoms were caused by what they were in the hospital for, either medications related to surgery or some sort of a withdrawal phenomenon or some sort of electrolyte imbalance. And that to me makes a whole lot of sense to yeah. understand psychiatric symptoms as, you know, very far down the road from an upstream phenomenon that is seated in the interconnectedness between different bodily systems. The problem is that when psychiatrists get to their Park Avenue offices in Manhattan, they forget about all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And most psychiatrists do not do laboratory screening. They have literally no appreciation of uh, potential resolvable root causes of psychiatric problems like nutrient deficiencies, thyroid dysfunction, food reactions, autoimmune syndromes, because things like depression, for example, are, are very impressionistic labels that mean almost mm -hmm. nothing. But psychiatrists use these words almost as justification for prescribing. But it's not only, I think, very antiquated way of thinking about bodily systems, but it's also dangerous in my opinion. So in my earlier training, I, I tried to focus mostly on the areas of psychiatry that at least acknowledge that there are many, many physical causes, many of which are reversible to what we are seeing as psychiatric symptoms. So if you really think about it, I mean, it can't be anything but physical, really. Yeah. I mean, listen, there are 
a lot of different ways to slice the criticisms, right? Sure. So, you know, some people ask me, you know, is there more depression or is it just better diagnosed? Because we have one in four women of reproductive age taking an antidepressant, for example, 11% of Americans are taking uh, psychotropics and more than half of the population has experienced depression at some point in their lives. So what is this about? You know, are we just coming under the label? Are we answering quizzes on our computer that are, you know, designed by Pfizer Mm -hmm. to help funnel us into our doctor's office and get our prescription? Or are we actually sicker and depression is just one of the manifestations? And I would say that it's both of those. Mm -hmm. And it's also really something sort of more existential that's happening in our evolution as a society, particularly here in America, where we have sort of lost touch with any type of you know, spirituality. We have no heritage. We have no ancestral wisdom passed down to us anymore. Many of us are are running families, growing children on our own, basically without communities. And the problem is that symptoms like distress or grief or even, you know, melancholy are considered like a nuisance. They get in the way of our productivity and we have to suppress them. And that's what the pharmaceutical industry has entrained us to believe. Uh, and, and we sort of like that idea because who wants to deal with pain and suffering? Mm-hmm. But the, the point is that anyone who's ever evolved in their lives knows that that evolution came from a place of pain and suffering. That's the only way we grow and change. It's the only way we get closer to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the point of life? You know, isn't that what we're here for? So there's also that layer of sort of despiritualizing the populace and pathologizing the very nature of human suffering that often is a catalyst for growth and change, not always. You know, there are many contributors because depression is just an, it's an impressionistic term and it has no specificity. So somebody can be appropriately responding to a loss, let's say, and mm-hmm. be labeled as depressed. Mm-hmm. Somebody can have circumstances in their lives that are not a good match for them, like a job they hate, and they can be medicated just so that they could tolerate it, yeah. you know. Or somebody could have a thyroid dysfunction, you know, brought on by industrial chemicals in the environment and it's manifesting as, as depression. And of course, treating with antidepressants would make no, no sense in that case. So there are many different ways to represent, you know, what psychiatry is trying to reduce to a serotonin deficiency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that kind of leads me to think to talking about, so this is more your approach to psychiatry and to depression and to mood issues and mental health is more like a functional approach, right? So would you expand on this idea of functional medicine and what a functional approach to health is? Yeah, so there are a lot of different terms flying around. There's integrative medicine, there's functional medicine, there's orthomolecular psychiatry, there's holistic medicine. And, you know, do they all come under the umbrella of alternative medicine? Well, I certainly resent that (laughs) placement, Mm. uh, marginalization, right? Because it was only with the the dawn of the pharmaceutical empire that the, you know, centuries old traditional wisdom around the interconnectedness of bodily systems and the relevance of mind, spirit, and soul became subsumed under this one pill, one ill model. So I would consider the pharmaceutical model to be quite alternative to what people have been doing to keep themselves healthy and well in ways that we certainly can't achieve these days for millions of years. The orientation that resonates most with me is is holistic medicine, but functional medicine is, is almost a subset of that, I would say, and one that focuses very much on, it's a growing establishment, really. I think it's like 100,000 doctors in the country right now, and many of them undergo formal training after their conventional training, so residency and fellowship. And they have to basically unlearn a lot of what they learned, you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, blood, sweat, and tears on. They have to unlearn it because the principle is very different. And the primary agenda is to look for the root cause of a problem. So your patient is presenting with eczema, digestive complaints, and insomnia, and fatigue. So you could address all of those symptoms, give them a stimulant, give them a a sleep aid, you know, give them some steroid cream, and you could send them on their way, you know, sort of patched together. And that's really the Western model, allopathic model. But a functional medicine approach would be to say, okay, so we're looking at an immune inflammatory 
you know, condition here. Where did this start? What was the inciting trigger? Was there a vaccine? Was there an antibiotic? Was there a major stress or a major loss? Was there international travel? What were some of the antecedents? What were some of the things that this patient brought to the table? Were they vaginally birthed? Were they breastfed? Were they chronically ear infected their mm-hmm. entire childhood? Mm-hmm. Uh, did they have their tonsils out? You know, what were the relevant factors that might have set them up for this primary trigger to take hold and to manifest all of these uh, seemingly unconnected symptoms. So as you work back in time, trying to understand the trajectory, then you can frame your interventions. And the interventions are typically rooted in lifestyle change because dietary change, meditation, proper sleep hygiene, movement, these are the ways that we can reset the nervous system, which of course controls all of our other functions in our body from immune to digestive to hormonal. And and that's how the body just sort of resets itself. (laughs) So you don't have Mm -hmm. to meddle with all these dead leaves if it were a dying tree. Instead, you just, you feed the soil and let the tree take, the tree knows how to grow. We don't know how to make a tree grow. The tree knows (laughs) how to grow, right? So it's like, if we just get out of the way, then all of the resolution takes place. And and chiropractors call this concept of vitalism, right? That the body has this innate wisdom and conventional medicine doesn't believe that, frankly. Conventional medicine believes that the body is broken and that we have to meddle with it, to tinker with it, put a little more of this, a little more of that, stop it from doing this. It's a Mm -hmm. totally different orientation from, you know, functional or holistic medicine. And I would just say my particular orientation is maybe a bit more extreme than functional medicines generally because I don't support any pharmaceutical use in my practice. And many functional medicine doctors practice more integratively, meaning they take a bit of conventional medicine, a bit of functional medicine, they sort of do both. Okay, when you're talking about this and we talk about the the patient and the, the doctor, but also we can take this model and really apply it to us as parents and caregivers with our children and finding out the root causes of their behavior or the root causes of, you know, um, a learning issue they're having or like we were talking about just now depression or um, what we might classify as depression or some kind of mood stuff that's going on or, you know, eczema and ADD and this whole phenomenon, all these things that our kids are being diagnosed with or maybe suffering from, I guess we could say, you know, we can use that model and really um, kind of see our children in a whole different way and, and help them in a different way to become healthy, would you say? Oh, absolutely. And it, it, it's really, you know, I don't treat children in my practice. I have two of my own at home. I, I'm not even sure I could tolerate. <laughs> I can barely, like, I have to look, I have to look through like a squinty eye at what's going on Yes, with, with our children today. It pains me so much that I, I can barely even tolerate what's happening. I mean, I read statistics that like 11% of children age four to 17, like one in five boys have this diagnosis of, of ADHD, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and guess what happens? You know, they're, they're put on stimulants, which of course the literature is non-existent and what does exist has essentially been bought. And there's a massive signal of harm. I mean, you cannot, there's no free lunch with pharma, okay? Mm-hmm. You cannot perturb the neurology and neurochemistry of your child with a pharmaceutical product and expect there to be no price to pay. Mm -hmm. And the the nature of that price is just barely being exposed to us. So while there are so many parents who are desperate and they cannot connect the dots, right? They can't, they haven't been trained to ask this question, why? Mm -hmm. Why is my child not sleeping? Why are they jumping out of their skin? Why are they rageful and hitting? What's happening? Is it that something in their food? Is it the dyes or the preservatives? Or is it a reaction to gluten or dairy or processed food products? Is it some exposure environmentally in the home? Is it electromagnetic fields? Is it mold? Or is it something situational? Are they Mm -hmm. just in the wrong environment? for their type of learning and their type of growth. We have to start to connect these dots because just suppressing the symptoms or trying to put a Band-Aid on a festering wound, Mm -hmm. it's not only not effective in the long term, and that's what the literature has borne out, but in in my opinion, it's really uh, a heinous crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. And we we really are going to look back as a species on this window of our evolution and, and feel great 
shame. Kelly, and I, I, I think too that I kind of, uh, sometimes it, I, get, I get a little, like I hyperventilate a little <laughs> thinking about the same thing and think, and I, the word that comes to mind is reckless. And it's almost like this pace, I, I, what do you attribute it to? Because I just keep thinking it's this pace of life because we have a really hard time slowing down and really focusing and paying attention. And a holistic approach requires attention and it requires time. It's not a quick fix. It's not, you know, take a pill and create this result. It's a healing and, it, you know, finding root causes isn't always easy and it takes a lot of patience. And some families are really just feeling that they can't take that time. So it's easier to use the pharmaceuticals. So what do you say to that? Like, what do you attribute all that to this whole sort of time that we're having where it's just really, we're finding the kids are really suffering? Yeah, I would, I would play devil's advocate because I don't think it is easier to take the pharmaceutical approach. I mean, I think we are, we are almost conditioned a lot by direct to consumer advertising to believe that it is easier. Just Mm -hmm. get a slip of paper from your doctor, head down to CVS and your problems are over. But that's certainly not what happens because, you know, we're talking about psych meds. They are notorious for their side effect profiles. They are now well documented for their very dramatic adverse events. I just got a paper on my desk uh, yesterday looking at, it was a Finnish Swedish study, looking at the link between psychotropic drugs and homicide, finding elevated risk for all categories. This is homicide, oh, yeah. okay? This is impulsive violence that mm-hmm. you know, results in the end of another human's life. So you're inviting a level of complexity and many insidious problems because a lot of psychiatric medication side effects are very insidious, like cognitive dysfunction, fatigue for adults as loss of libido, flattening of mood, and many times patients aren't even aware of the side effects that they're having. And there's a psychiatrist uh, activist, Peter Bregan, who's been writing about this for 30 years, and he calls it medication spellbinding. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that it's in fact buying you a much more expensive, complex road of treatment where your child will never not be a patient. You enter that mill and you ain't getting out. (laughs) You know, that's how it works. You're in there for life. You are a customer for life. So to put the investment, the whole family to invest in looking at these lifestyle factors and giving a total rehab of lifestyle a try is probably the least expensive, least onerous option because it has the greatest potential for true resolution of symptoms in a lasting way. So there's really no excuse excuse, frankly, Um, you know, and and the only reason that people don't do it is because they're not armed with the information, which is Mm -hmm. obviously why events like this are important. That is why we are here. Okay, so I'm going to just I'm going to change gears just for a second. Then we're going to return to some things here. But I skipped a question that I had for you. And I want to know, can you define what psychosomatic medicine is? Yeah, so that's a term, you know, it actually has uh, colloquial implications uh, for, for being sort of like imagined, right? Okay. Like imagined problems. Yes. And in my training, it was the name of my fellowship, which is this mind-body fellowship, which is a more legitimate use of the word, actually. But colloquially, it's used to imply that the patients are imagining, essentially, or experiencing out of stress or something like that. It's almost like hysteria in this very misogynist way, like that it used to be used, where it was that women are just like, you know, sensitive to distress. And, And psychiatry takes advantage of this idea, you know, because a lot of conventional doctors reach the upper limits of what they can do for patients through conventional testing and medication treatment. And they send patients to psychiatrists saying that what they're experiencing, whether it's fatigue, you know, low libido, insomnia, depression, anxiety, cloudy thinking, that these things are all in their head. Mm -hmm. And so they must be psychiatric. And so that's where that term Mm -hmm. psychosomatic can take on a very dangerous role because the implication is that it's something psychological or imagined when in reality, many times it's a medication side effect that's unacknowledged or it's a physiologic problem that hasn't been properly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, okay, so we're talking a lot about um, mood and that's what you do in your practice and you work mostly with women. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So, and and so you're only with women, only with women. And so, but I would say indirectly with children too, because working on mama, working on mom, you know, increases the health of the whole family, right? Yes. And most of my patients are either pre-pregnancy, pregnant or postpartum. 
Okay. And so you, and then on your website, it declares that your practice, holistic women's health psychiatry, focuses on the identification of root causes of symptoms and natural treatments for the whole body wellness, perinatal nutrition, lifestyle and environmental medicine considerations for mom and baby. So for all, everyone listening, all our caregivers listening, can you tell me more about your work with women? Like, do tell us what you do with mom and baby. Sure. So in my specialization, I focused on reproductive psychiatry, which I was talking about before, which is the treatment of pregnant and breastfeeding women. My, of course, conventional training was in medicating these women. So in in having a, a conversation with them around informed consent, so I have to give credit to my training and the mentors that I did have at that time because there was a strong emphasis put on informed consent, uh, which is the idea of sitting down with a patient, having a lengthy discussion where you explore all of the available literature, mm -hmm. the uh, literature that isn't yet available, the limitations of the literature, and you talk about alternatives. You know, this conversation, I would have a patient who maybe got Got pregnant, she was taking Zoloft. We would have that conversation to determine mm -hmm. whether she should continue taking it. And I started to, my sort of activist hat was put on when I had um, several patients get flu shots from drugstores. This was in like 2009, so it was the H1N1 season, who were pregnant, uh, one of whom suffered fetal demise. I think, of course, related to that, and that was that actually is documented as being tremendously increased risk in that flu season that the CDC was aware of. Mm -hmm. But I, it started to set off alarm bells for me about how important it is for women to know the full truth about pharmaceutical products that they're going to engage. Mm -hmm. I really departed, took a left turn. <laughs> from conventional treatment at that time. And, and really it was largely informed by the fact that I had patients who, you know, I would sit down with them, talk about the 25,000 cases in the literature of antidepressant exposure, and they weren't reassured. They didn't want to take medication and they were still symptomatic and they were already in psychotherapy. So then mm -hmm. what do I have to offer them? Nothing. I'm just going to let them wing it. Yeah. So that certainly didn't didn't fit. So there, I had I felt compelled to identify a methodology clinically, whereby I could offer a woman something that was also beneficial for her baby. So it wasn't this sort of like Sophie's choice of like mm -hmm. treatment for the mom mm -hmm. that might injure the baby. But what is the you know? It's mm -hmm. just the, and of course there are gross limitations to the type of um, safety data. That, that supports the prescription of antidepressants uh, in pregnancy. But that's, you know, a whole other discussion, uh, probably. I really, it really resonated with me to work with lifestyle medicine and to work with um, identification of, let's say, nutrient deficiencies or autoimmune processes or inflammatory issues that could be resolved through lifestyle medicine for the benefit of the mom, the pregnancy, and the, the baby. Because now we know that those nine months in utero are what, what has been dubbed the fetal origins of adult disease, that mm. there is tremendous programming that goes on on what's called an epigenetic level uh, during those months and also during you know at least the first two to three years of life that has an impact on the health of that adult, you know, when that baby becomes an adult and that our predispositions are not so much genetic as they are set up for us by the nature of our in utero experience, birth and breastfeeding um, duration. So, you know, it, it really is very satisfying uh, for me to have arrived at this place where I can, I can resolve psychiatric symptoms with radical dietary change within 30 days. Mm. And I have not only no need for medication in my practice, but I also can put women in a much better position to safely come off medication because we've done something to resolve what brought them to medication in the first place to resolve the root cause. So Kelly, I'm pretty sure people perked up when you said that. When you said radical dietary change, you said dietary, did you? Um, yes. In 30 days. So do you want to give us a couple of um, thoughts about what you actually do with the, in those 30 days? Like a little, sure. a few more specifics. 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I have a very strong interest in nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, but I also have an aversion to dogma. So, right. Um, and I like to sort of think for myself. So the closest that I have come to in terms of sort of intellectual heroes in the nutrition realm um, are, is, is probably uh, one who's dead and one who's living. So the one yeah. who's dead is Weston <laughs> Price, who is a dentist who traveled the world in the 1900s seeking information information about what traditional uh, cultures were eating to help them avoid the degenerative diseases and dental decay that were taking Americans by storm around that time. And so, there, you know, he observed that, you know, people all over the world in his meticulous documentation ate totally different diets from 100% meat and fat diets to nearly 100% carbohydrate diets and that they were well you know, and that they were all well. So I'm very interested in, in how do we know, you know, what diet is best for what folks. I have been using a template in my practice for, uh, you know, about the past, whatever, seven, eight years, um, that is essentially a very simple whole, whole foods diet. It's limited, you know, limiting processed foods and agricultural foods. So it's essentially like an ancestral diet quote unquote, which is, of course, very conscious of sourcing. So all pasture and animal products, all organic produce. So it's meat, including red meat, fish, eggs, vegetables of all varieties, including a focus on root vegetables, nuts and seeds, and then a focus on a lot of natural fats. So coconut oil, ghee, the animal foods, and then vegetarian, other vegetarian sources like olive oil, nuts and seeds. The reason that this has been so effective for my patient population is because many of my patients are similar and similar in nature and they're presenting to me for similar reasons. Many of them have blood sugar instability called reactive hypoglycemia mm -hmm. that masquerades as either intense fatigue or sometimes uh, anxiety, even panic attacks. So using natural fat is an important thing to do to help resolve the hypoglycemia. Uh, but I've also uh, learned a lot from a mentor that I've developed later in my career who's named Nicholas Gonzalez. He's a pioneer in holistic medicine here in New York. He treats mostly cancer patients, uh, but he has refined what Weston Price brought to us and has associated dietary interventions with different nervous system dominance profiles. So he has a, an elaborate method of determining what types of diets, whether it's a mostly plant-based diet to a mostly meat-based diet, are best based on essentially what, what type of a nervous system you have, whether mm -hmm. you're somebody who's a morning person who's very high, strong, and anxious versus whether you're somebody who is like tends toward melancholic depression, who's pretty slow and sleepy a lot of the time, slow to get going in the morning. These are autonomic orientations that help us understand patients more personally. And then we can use food to stimulate different branches of the autonomic nervous system. And he's really expanded my consciousness on that because I think it's totally absurd to suggest that there is one diet for all people. But for the types of patients who come to me who are mostly depressed and anxious, who often are struggling with hormonal and autoimmune issues, often set off by pregnancy, you know, these are the types of patients who tend to respond very well to the type of diet I just described. So, you know, it just happens to be that that's the cohort I, I landed with and that I intuited, you know, over the years that this was the right diet. It was also from my personal experience because I've tried a number of different diets from vegetarian to ketogenic. I'm very much like my own patient population in demographic and in health conditions that I've had. And so I know what works. Very interesting. Nicholas Gonzalez. You're saying, and yeah. Wesley Price, for sure. And so really, you start off with this basis of a whole foods diet, which is like, that's the one thing maybe might say that is good for everybody. <laughs> and yeah, then you tweak from there. there. Yes. Yeah, you tweak yeah. from there. The variation, you know, so what you'll find after the end of the month is if you didn't feel well, that's very significant information. And if yes. you're somebody who is averse to red meat, let's say generally it makes you like gag and you're not interested, mm -hmm. you have to listen to what your body has to tell you mm -hmm. about these attachments to different kinds of foods, because it may be an ancestral orientation trying to express itself. Once you get all of the crap out of the way, then you can start to listen to your body's own intuition about food. So I never have patients uh, do portion control or calorie counting 
none of that. So a lot of it is just more intuitive eating once we you know, define the parameters of what real food actually is. Wonderful. Would you say that there are some foods that are just bad mood foods? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I and, and this is not actually um, Dr. Gonzalez's orientation, but I have uh, observed very dramatic reactions to gluten and dairy uh, in my practice. And it may be because most people consume the highly processed forms of dairy and uh, gluten, you know, wheat flour, and that the, the immune system is reacting almost more to the processing than even to the proteins themselves that are flagged by the immune system. But I, you know, we don't really know. But there is an interesting body of literature in psychiatry that implicates the gliadin in in wheat and related grains and also the casein in dairy and many different psychiatric pathologies from schizophrenia to major depression. I have several very severe obsessive compulsive disorder patients in my practice who have like literally it's an on off switch when they consume gluten. So it's, it can be very dramatic or sometimes it can be subtle, you know, that you just feel they feel like uh, the, the fog is lifting a bit. Um, so I would say, you know, those two categories I tend to harp on. I also have grave concerns about genetically modified foods and glyphosate, uh, Roundup sprayed produce uh, for the gut disrupting properties that now we have a good understanding of what this chemical Monsanto's prized uh, possession, uh, what it does to our gut bacteria, how important our gut mm -hmm. bacteria is to our mental health and behavior and the, the mystery bag of risks associated with uh, genetically engineered foods is, is something beyond <laughs> our ability to even quantify at this point. So those are primarily soy and corn that isn't organic, although for the most part, those are two foods I don't really recommend generally. Okay, good. And so, and also too, Kelly, I want to know, what are you seeing in your practice as well as far as these sort of mental health issues that are presenting themselves um, in the women that come to see you, like postpartum depression, that's considered very common? Yeah, so it's the estimates are like 11 to 20 percent of women are developing. So it's like almost one in five women are developing symptoms consistent with postpartum depression. Now, there there is a lot of like awareness generating efforts on the part of the psychiatric community. I'm very involved in conventional uh, conversations about postpartum depression, and the the rallying cry is that women need more medication access. They need to be less stigmatized for their experience so that they can get the treatment they deserve. I personally, and I prescribe to women for many years who are breastfeeding and otherwise in the postpartum period. My current orientation is that that is a dangerous practice. There are three placebo control trials uh, for efficacy in the postpartum population for antidepressants, and the safety data would be almost impossible to accrue in a responsible way. And all of the media making infanticides and suicides in postpartum women have been women who were treated with antidepressants, yes. many of whom had just started them. And we know, and we can no longer deny that these medications have significant risk for impulsive, violent behavior. Mm -hmm. So when you are treating a woman with an antidepressant in the postpartum period, you are refusing to acknowledge that there is a complex symphony of immunologic and neurochemical, as well as endocrine factors that are bringing her to your office with her specific symptoms. And to think that an antidepressant with, with its known and unknown effects is the appropriate intervention for a postpartum woman, to me, I just, I don't know how I ever took the bait. <laughs> I don't know how I ever mm -hmm. believed that that made any sense because it's, it's almost like cartoonish level ridiculous to me. Uh, and talk about reckless, as you mentioned. So I do see a lot of postpartum depression. I also see a lot of women who are scared of postpartum depression. I see women who aren't even pregnant yet, and they're terrified that they're going to develop postpartum depression. Yes. It's like we've lost all attachment to everything that is incredible and transformative and profound about pregnancy and birth. And all we're worrying about is, are we going to become a psych patient on the other end? It's tragic. Mm -hmm. So I try to work with women to reinstill the locus of control so that they feel that they have agency, so that they feel they are doing everything they can to support their pregnancy, support the health of their baby, and to prevent 
any massive onslaught of symptoms. That said, you know, for example, about probably 80% of my patients have autoimmune thyroid conditions, you know, and I I struggled with that personally. So it's a bit of like to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I, I look for it. Yeah. And where I look, I find it. So if you know the trajectory of postpartum thyroiditis, you know that it can look a lot like like almost mania. Mm-hmm. And then, and, and even according to at least one study, there was an association with postpartum psychosis and thyroid antibodies. And then later on, it looks like depression. Yeah. So the symptom overlap is almost 100%. So, you know, if you don't know how to screen effectively for uh, postpartum thyroiditis, then, you know, you could really be missing the boat or at least managing symptoms in a way that, that doesn't do anything to un- undo the, the root cause. Right. So, you know, postpartum depression happens to be another one of these grab bag uh, terms, a lot of suffering, you know, some of which, again, may be on a more psychological, psychosocial level, because we are raising our babies, as I mentioned, without the help of women in our lives, you know, without Mm -hmm. our mothers, without our aunts, without villages that traditionally and ancestrally helped us to navigate learning a totally new craft, which is motherhood, right? Now we're just, you know, we, we stop work. I mean, I worked up until the day I gave birth both times and I was back at work three weeks later Wow! and I'm fortunate to have my my mom who's very intimately and dad who are very intimately involved in my life that's extremely unusual I don't know anyone else who is in the position that I am what the position most people are in is that they hire strangers to run the business of raising their their baby and we don't have that guidance so to feel lost, to feel overwhelmed, to feel inadequate, incompetent. These are psychological experiences that can inform um, a woman's postpartum trajectory for the worse. So, yeah. And quite natural too. Like, why would you not feel that way? I mean, of course you're going to feel that way. Okay, so getting back to this sort of idea about individuality, and do you do a lot of testing I don't do a lot of testing. I do blood work up front and I look for autoimmune markers, inflammatory markers like, you know, CRP and homocysteine. I look for basic vitamin deficiencies, a couple of the B vitamins, vitamin D. And then I'll also just take a look, you know, at liver, you know, basic stuff, medical stuff, liver function. So there's a toxicity marker called GGT. Look at electrolyte balance because you can see a bit about adrenal function and electrolytes. So you can read a lot between the, the lines. And I've learned a lot of that through my functional medicine training and taught myself some of it. So I do do blood work mostly to, to help me know if there's some place more urgent for me to enter. And, and then otherwise, it's just sort of like a baseline. I'd look a lot at sugar markers to help me understand how much you know sugar imbalance is, in, is informing the presentation. And then once in a while, I'll do, if there hasn't been significant improvement after 30 days of dietary change, I'll do a stool test yes. um, so that I can better understand what is what has taken hold in the flora in the gut, because you can change that dramatically within 72 hours, according to literature, with dietary change. So mm. it's not always necessary to start with a stool test. And then sometimes I will do more esoteric testing, like fatty acid testing. If yes. I see a patient who's, let's say, vegan, and I want to know whether or not we need to supplement more aggressively with certain types of fatty acids, or um, I'll do a salivary test for stress hormone but for the most part, these are for me. <laughs> you know, these are like almost academic interests, a lot of these tests, because we could do a lot of what we do in the initial push without really any testing. So Right, right. And the testing just kind of kind of gives you an idea of where you started and where you ended, but with the dietary exactly. and the yeah, all those changes, those things all all straighten out. Exactly. It's yeah. and it can be satisfying. And I have, you know, I'm interested in I even have this like meditation device called a muse. And it's like, you know, it's like this app on my phones. Of course, I have to irradiate my brain with electromagnetic fields. Oh, no, I don't like that either. While I'm meditating. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, anyway, I can get to see. It's like an EEG of my um, meditation se- session. So I'm very into like data. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably a relic from my conventional training, focusing more on, on the data than the process. But I don't, you know, I wouldn't want to overplay how important it is because it's it's secondary. Yeah, for sure. I'm a data geek myself. I kind of like that. I kind of like that. But it's not not always necessary. Okay, so taking this holistic approach, we talked a lot about diet. 
would you give us a couple of ideas as far as what um, you know women can do about these kinds of mental health troubles besides diet? You mentioned sleep as well. Sleep is one of these things because the more I talk to patients who have insomnia about how important sleep is, the more stressed out about sleeping they get. A lot of it ends up just being about creating an environment where your body can actually take advantage of the opportunity to sleep. So you have to give yourself the opportunity to sleep, which for many of us is what we're not doing, right? Like literally make the time. But then you have to create almost like a neurological environment for your body and brain to shut down. So, you know, you can use things like amber lenses, like blue blocking lenses. You can, there are apps on your computer that filter out um, the blue light. You can just power down, you know, at nine o'clock at night. There are simple, simple things that you can use from homeopathy to amino acids like glycine for support. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then a lot of it is just making sure that your sleeping space is like pitch black, dark, that it's quiet and that you engage some sort, I think it's helpful to engage some sort of practice for stimulating your relaxation nervous system, your parasympathetic nervous system. So whether it's guided meditation or breathing or progressive muscle relaxation or something along those lines, then you'll help to redirect that. So I do think sleep is totally critical. I also encourage people to start moving if they're not already. And I used to hate exercise for the better part of my existence. I never exercise. I, <laughs> I just, metabolism, as I, you know, ended up being one of these those, you know, thin sort of no matter what. Um, so I didn't really have the incentive to do it. And I was probably had mitochondrial dysfunction my whole adult life. So I always got really tired, had no stamina. Mm. And, um, and, you know, delving into the research on exercise, it is irrefutable that we have a very powerful tool. And we think of exercise as like an activity, but of course we used to just move around the earth. Mm-hmm. You know? We and walk. We have, to, we have to make <laughs> the time. We have to, you know, get standing desks and for, put timers yes. on our get us to stand up every 15 minutes. Um, but I'm a big fan of the low uh, volume, high intensity exercise. So like 20 minutes of an interval training, which is like something on an elliptical machine, or you can do jumping jacks or jump rope or do, you know, military burpees or anything that gets your heart rate going to the point of sweating within 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. And then you have 90 seconds of recovery and you do eight of those cycles. And if you do that twice a week, you're going to get more bang for your buck than if you did 40 minutes of aerobic running Mm. every day. So that's why my patients, you know, I practice in Manhattan. My patients, uh, you know, live this fast paced lifestyle. They don't have time for anything. And so this type of thing, you know, appeals to them. So I do think, you know, movement, meditation, sleep, I would say sun exposure is incredibly important. Totally afraid of the sun for all the wrong reasons based on, you know, total misinterpretation of what cancer actually is. And we've lost our relationship to the external environment, you know, which is having this circadian rhythm of sunlight exposure. And so I do think that's, you know, sunlight exposure before noon is very important. If you can get out, Mm -hmm. you know, between 11 and 1 with no sunscreen for 15, 20 minutes, that's even better. You know, these are the simple things that can all conspire to send your body a very different signal. And I I would also just throw in there like a practical tip that is another one that I've really learned the importance of from Dr. Gonzalez, which is hydration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the importance of, there's a lot of debate about, you know, too much water. Are we drinking too much? Should we drink less? What kind of water? And I normally recommend filtered water or spring water. So reverse osmosis, like Mountain Valley, spring water in glass bottle and, you know, eat to 10 glasses a day, you know, half your body weight in ounces, especially during breastfeeding is totally critical. Just think about it. It's common sense, you know, that you replace the volume that you're, you're losing. So that can make a, a very dramatic clinical difference, which when you think of it as just like a wellness factor, it can actually make a clinical difference in resolution of symptoms if you stay on top of that. Water and salt, I would say. Awesome. 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 Do you have time for one more question? Sure. Yeah. Okay. 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 So what I mentioned before about taking care of mom, that just trickles down to the entire family. You can apply all of this to the whole family as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think that you're just such a wonderful speaker and so eloquent and so much information that you give and just bang on. And I love watching your videos and I've been enjoying those talks that you give for James Maskell's Functional Forum. (laughs) Uh, I love them. They're so awesome. But in those talks and all the things that you're saying, you talk about 
about reforming psychiatry? Now, this is a big question. Like, in a nutshell, what do you mean by that? And how can we do that for the betterment of the mental health of our moms, our women? Yeah. So, gosh, I could talk about that for all day long, literally. It's I, I feel so passionately about it. Um, you know, in New Jersey, a bill was just passed that allowed minors to consent to psychiatric drug treatment without the knowledge of their parents. This is mm. the direction that we are moving in. Wow. Psychiatry is a very dangerous field because it does not use any objective testing or diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Anyone can be a psych patient based on a brief conversation with a, a medical doctor that is who essentially uh, asserts a subjective impression of a patient's behavior. And psychiatry also has established precedent for eliminating an individual's civil rights and mandating treatment against the patient's will. So this happens in other arenas. It happens in cancer care. It happens in infectious disease. Yes. But it never. It happens daily in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. I've worked in the Bellevue Emergency Room for many years here in New York. And I've always been a libertarian. I've always been oriented towards the protecting civil liberties. But I had it within my rights, even as a medical student, let alone as a trainee, to decide with one other physician that I could take away the rights of any human walking into that emergency room or brought in by ambulance and force injectable treatment wow. with medications onto them. This goes on every day mm -hmm. in this country and around the world. Mm -hmm. So I would put a plug because this is such a complex topic, I would put a plug in for a website that is run by a very pioneering um, individual, Robert Whitaker, who's a journalist. It's called madinamerica.com. I'm a contributor and it's a very helpful forum. And they have a big section on questions you should ask or think about before you take a medication. They also have a lot of help and resources for people already taking medications who want to come off. But I would essentially try to bring some exposure and awareness to the corruption. And I hate to use that word. It's so inflammatory. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's, it's very accurate. And there's really no other word to apply to the situation around the evidence base in psychiatry that undermines everything you might believe about the safety and efficacy of medications used for psychiatric patients and also invite you to consider a totally different paradigm mm -hmm. that, again, as I said, offers you the potential for lasting resolution so that you don't just enter onto a conveyor belt you know, you'll never get off of and that will only continue to have more and more medications piled onto it. And then, you know, one day that you do decide you do want to stop taking medication, it can be a very, very onerous process. So it's a very, very big decision. I think I would just leave people with that to take the decision extremely seriously to yeah. get a couple of different opinions from different types of providers, those that look at the body as uh, with more sophistication and to shed some of the fear, right? Because what brings us to engaging the medical model is fear. Yes. And sometimes if we just breathe and wait, it shifts. Mm -hmm. That's the rule of distress, right? Mm -hmm. That's always the rule of distress is that it has, a, it has a peak, right? And yes. then the peak passes and it shifts. It doesn't always get better immediately, but it shifts mm. so that you can look at it somewhat differently. This is a complex topic and I certainly don't want to be overly simplifying of it, but I, but I do have grave concerns and I do think that women and children are the target audience for what is going to be an onslaught over the next decade of pharmaceutical pressure mm. to become lifelong customers. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well said. Okay, so Kelly, I better let you go. I've kept you a very long time. And so <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure. We can keep going. So is there anything else you'd like our summit participants, the caregivers and, and families listening? Is there anything you want them to know about your current projects and where to find you? Oh, sure. I have a website where I try to keep, I am very obsessed so with the data. I try to sort of crunch it down into bite sizes called snippets. I have a newsletter there that uh, where I keep everyone up to, do, up to date. I also have a new free ebook, which is an introduction to a lot of these concepts around the way that I use food in my practice. So, you know, that's available there also. And I'm on social media, of mm -hmm. course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I also just want want to put a plug for an activist group that I'm involved in 
called Health Freedom Action. You can find us on Facebook and we have a website, healthfreedomaction.org. It's an outgrowth of a platform called fearlessparent.org that mm. I've been involved with, yes. with uh, Louise Sabakis and others, um, which is essentially aiming to support unconventional parenting decisions through protection of our rights to engage our own health paradigms. Awesome. So Louise actually spoke for the last summit. So if anybody wants to pick that one up, go ahead and have a listen. So fearlessparent.org is the parent of the healthfreedomaction.org. Correct? Yeah, it's one of the affiliates. affiliates. And Healthy Action is a huge umbrella effort. And we're trying to, you know, gather everyone from religious groups to those who, who even engage the conventional model and let's say are supporters of vaccination, uh, but still believe that as Americans, we must protect our right to make our own parental decisions. Yeah. So it's, you know, who isn't for health freedom? <laughs> yeah, and us here in Canada too. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is, a, you know, because what, what happens in, in the U.S. happens globally. Yeah. You know that. You know that. So best to uh, best to hit it, strike it at the root here. That's right. That's right. Okay. And your website is kellybroganmd.com. You got it. All right, Kelly. Thanks so much for all your time. That was fantastic. All right, Carla. Total pleasure. Thanks for being part of the summit.